Picture this. A billion dollar game studio spends years building what they believe is the perfect anti-piracy system. Millions of dollars invested. Cutting edge encryption technology. They launch their game with confidence. Only to watch helplessly as hackers completely bypass their security within 48 hours. This exact scenario played out with Hogwarts Legacy, one of the most anticipated games in recent memory. Warner Brothers poured fortunes into Denuvo's supposedly uncrackable DRM protection. The hacking community? They treated it like a weekend project. Nuts. What we're looking at here isn't just about getting games for free. This represents a full-scale digital rebellion. A silent war raging between massive corporations and underground coding geniuses who operate by one simple philosophy. No lock is truly unbreakable. Today, we're pulling back the curtain on a shadowy world of game cracking, where hackers consistently outsmart sophisticated anti-piracy systems, create elaborate fake servers, and turn corporate security measures inside out. By the time we're done, you'll understand exactly why the piracy community lives by that controversial motto. Piracy isn't stealing, if buying doesn't actually mean owning. So let's begin this journey into the digital underground. Let's travel back to when game protection was almost charmingly simple. During the 1990s and early 2000s, you'd buy a physical copy of a game, type in a basic key like Doom 1234-5678. And that was it. You were in. Hackers didn't even need to crack these systems in the traditional sense. They simply reverse engineered the pattern behind these keys and created programs called keygens that could generate endless valid keys automatically. Game companies quickly realized they had a serious problem on their hands. Their response was to develop more complex offline algorithms. Sophisticated mathematical formulas built directly into the game's code that could verify your key without needing to connect to any server. On paper, this seemed like a smart solution. But the hacking community was already two steps ahead. They began using professional disassembling tools like IDA Pro to look directly into a game's code. Once inside, they could locate the exact function responsible for license verification and either completely remove it or, more cleverly, reprogram it to always return a positive response regardless of what key was entered. This back and forth marked just the beginning of an ongoing arms race between developers and hackers. Because what came next would fundamentally change the landscape of game security. Enter Denuvo, the current boogeyman of game cracking. This wasn't just about verifying keys anymore. Modern DRM, or digital rights management, functions like an overzealous security guard that lives inside your game constantly watching and checking your credentials. When you launch a game protected by Denuvo, it performs multiple security checks. It creates a complete fingerprint of your hardware setup. It scans for any signs of virtual machines or debugging tools. It contacts company servers to verify your license. And it continues running these checks periodically while you play. Hackers responded with increasingly sophisticated countermeasures. Some groups built entire fake server infrastructures designed to perfectly mimic the official verification systems. When the game would ask, is this player legitimate? These rogue servers would simply respond with absolute confirmation. Other hackers went even further, finding ways to extract and replicate the actual developer certificates used to sign legitimate game copies. Perhaps the most audacious example occurred with Metro Exodus where hackers managed to compromise an actual Steam developer account. Rather than cracking the game directly, they tricked Valve's own systems into generating completely legitimate activation keys for them. But the real magic happens in your computer's memory through a process called memory patching. This is where hackers bypass protections without even modifying the game files themselves. Tools like Goldberg Emulator or Empress's custom loaders operate with surgical precision. Here's how it works in practice. You run a special loader program before launching the game. This loader injects custom code directly into the game's active memory. When the game performs its DRM verification check, the loader intercepts the request. It then provides a false positive response, essentially telling the game everything checks out perfectly. The game continues running normally, with no files actually altered on your hard drive. 
This explains why many modern cracks include a separate executable file. That small program serves as a digital illusionist, creating temporary changes that exist only in your computer's active memory. By the time any anti-cheat systems think to look for tampering, all evidence has already disappeared. Now let's examine the actual toolkit these hackers use on a daily basis. First we have IDA Pro and Ghidra, professional grade disassemblers that can cost upwards of $10,000. These powerful tools transform raw game code into something human readable, allowing hackers to locate and neutralize critical checks like license verification routines. Debugging tools like X64DBEG and X32DBEG give hackers the ability to freeze games mid-execution, modify values in real time, and precisely identify when and where DRM validations occur. Interestingly, many hackers use Cheat Engine, the same tool favored by speedrunners, to bypass license checks through direct memory manipulation. For games tied to platforms like Steam, utilities such as Steamless and Universal Steam Emulator create complete virtual environments that perfectly mimic Steam's API layer, allowing games to run completely offline. The typical cracking process follows a methodical sequence. First, the game executable is extracted from memory. Next, specialists analyze the protection triggers using disassemblers. Then they create custom hooks to bypass security checks. A loader is developed to apply these patches during runtime. Finally, extensive testing is conducted across multiple system configurations to ensure reliability. This isn't the work of isolated individuals working alone in their basements. The most successful operations are conducted by organized teams that rival professional development studios in their structure and specialization. Take Empress for example, the enigmatic solo hacker who has managed to crack de novo protections single-handedly. While known for eccentric manifestos, their technical skills are undeniable. Then there's Codex, the old guard of cracking groups responsible for bypassing protections on major titles like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Cyberpunk 2077 before their mysterious disappearance. Groups like CPY specialize in always online games, constructing complete fake server infrastructures to bypass connectivity requirements. These organizations operate with remarkable efficiency, dividing labor much like tech startups. Reverse engineers analyze protection schemes. Skilled coders develop bypass methods. Dedicated testers verify stability across configurations. Distribution teams handle the final release process. Many of these groups adhere to an unofficial ethical code. They typically avoid targeting indie games that don't have significant DRM. Medical and military software is strictly off limits. Most importantly, they draw a distinction between cracking and stealing, viewing their work as bypassing restrictions rather than taking property. This brings us to the complex ethical debate surrounding game cracking. The hacking community's central argument is encapsulated in their motto. Piracy isn't stealing if buying doesn't mean truly owning. And when you examine modern digital distribution models, their position isn't without merit. Consider these realities. Games could be remotely disabled by publishers, as Ubisoft has done in the past. Online servers eventually shut down, like what happened with the PT demo. Accounts containing hundreds of dollars worth of games can be banned without recourse through services like Steam. The uncomfortable truth is that with digital purchases, you don't actually own the games in any traditional sense. However, there's another side to this story that deserves equal consideration. Independent studios frequently report losing 30 to 60% of potential sales to piracy. I've spoken with developers who were forced to lay off staff because their game was pirated half a million times in its first week alone. Then there are the genuine risks associated with pirated software. Studies suggest up to 75% of cracked games contain some form of malware cryptocurrency miners that silently slow your system. Keyloggers designed to steal sensitive information. The legal consequences can be severe too, as demonstrated by Nintendo's lawsuit against a single mother fined $32,000 for pirating Mario games. 
This technological arms race shows no signs of ending. As developers implement AI-powered anti-piracy measures, hackers continue to adapt and evolve their methods. But at its core, game cracking represents more than just getting something for free. It's about maintaining control over the media we consume. It's about preserving access to games when companies abandon them. It's about pushing back against always online requirements and draconian DRM schemes. So where do you stand on this complex issue? Is piracy a victimless crime in an era of digital restrictions? A form of protest against corporate overreach? Or is it simply theft by another name? I'm genuinely curious to hear your perspective in the comments. If you found this deep dive into the world of game cracking interesting, let me know by liking this video. For more uncensored explorations of technology's shadowy corners, consider subscribing also. And remember, whether you choose to pirate or pay, the most important thing is to stay informed, spend wisely, and above all, stay curious. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.